Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Ian Hill. I'm the Vice President of NPA Southern Sydney Branch. Uh, we're here on Durrawal land, uh, and we acknowledge the Elders past, present and emerging. We uh, understand that the land has never been ceded, and we pay respects to those that, that particular language group. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone along to uh, this evening's presentation, yet another exciting monthly presentation in a whole history of them, and all of them are available as they're recorded um, on YouTube eventually. And Gary, uh, our secretary, who will be speaking at the end of the evening, um, also has the, uh, the links for those YouTube. So if there's any particular back issues you wish to have a look at or see this one again, um, in time, what happens is it's recorded. I send it to NPA headquarters. They send it to another person who um, converts it to YouTube. We then get the links and we can then send that round to everyone. So tonight, of course, we've got we're very fortunate to have such a key speaker, Andrew Cox, who was uh, um, for many years, uh, from nine years, actually, 2000 to 2009, he told me today he was... Uh, the NPA executive officer, a very, very uh, esteemed position. And then he moved on from there to be the, now the chief executive officer of the Invasive Species Council. And he's going to, uh, yeah, there's many things that he's achieved and he's going to, I think, without any further ado, take us through another, uh, through an interesting presentation. So over to you, Andrew, thanks for coming. Right. Okay. Hello, everybody. It feels like I'm amongst many dear friends from uh, NPA. I have very fond memories. Um, so tonight, really, what I wanted to do is to, I guess, take you on the journey I've been going on, which is to really hopefully open your eyes up to the really severe impacts that invasive species are causing to the natural environment. So, um, let me try to talk about extinctions and hopefully some solutions to uh, this seemingly difficult problem, this really wicked problem. So I usually start by just talking a bit about the some of our well-known invasive species. We all are aware of the rabbits and the prickly pears and the cane toads, and it's a sad story of invasion and uh, rabbits are particularly bad because they impact on our plants. Um, but once they spread beyond a certain point, um, it's eradication becomes next to impossible. And I think this is why um, often it feels overwhelming. And often it takes, I mean, rabbits were relatively quick, but often the invasion process takes many, many decades just under our noses and often mm. we don't even realize it's occurring. So I think that's part of the reason why the awareness is quite low. So what I wanted to um, explain is to help, is to really uh, help remind us about how significant this problem is. This is um, some data we've been pulling together a database of extinctions in Australia. Now, it's often quite hard to work out how many species are actually extinct because our, our um, registers through the federal laws aren't up to date. Um, often species that we think are extinct, we find them again, many plants we rediscover. But from the best work we've managed to pull together, um, in, if we're just looking at extinctions since colonization um, in Australia, there's there's probably 84, I say probably because we actually won't know for sure, but probably about 84 animals and plants that are extinct. And um, our mammal record is the worst in the world, largely because of cats. But if you look at the drivers of the, those loss, it's not habitat loss, it's not um, anything else. The main driver is invasive species, particularly for our animals. So 58% um, of the all the animals and plants that are extinct um, 
is due to invasive species. Now, the big the big drivers for the mammals are, are cats. Of those 34 mammals that are extinct, cats were the driver for about 25 at least. And then there, we have foxes on top of that. Um, for our rep, for our birds, often it's the rodents on offshore islands. We have a lot of endemic birds on our islands. For reptiles, the big driver was a chytrid fungus, a fungus of uh, frogs. And we've lost uh, uh, six or seven frogs just due, due to that that fungus. So that's um, that's our pretty shameful record of extinction in Australia. Um, and surprisingly, the extinction rate is not slowing down. Um, we're probably averaging about four or five extinctions every decade. And most of those are still continue to be invasive species driven. So and it looking, it's looking like those extinctions into the future are going to continue at least at the same rate. So even though we now have all this information um, and knowledge, we're not slowing down that rate, and that's quite alarming. Now, we've done some work recently looking at the modern extinction since 1960. And actually, I think this, um, yeah, what, what this is showing is that the, um, the, ex the extinctions even more recently are still due to invasive species. Um, so again, like I mentioned, that, that record of loss is still um, staying high. And, and these are some of the species that we've lost even just since 2000. Now, understanding extinctions, you've got to look at the stories of each of these species and really work out, well, what really happened? And that's what this report did. So you can go onto our website. You can just Google Gone and Invasive Species Council, and you'll probably find it straight away, this, this, uh, this report. But in the last um, 24 years, these six species we've lost, almost all of the extinctions over since 1960 are, are animals. And the, the top row, and then the, the one on the left, Lister's gecko, are all were, were ex animals that are only found on Christmas Island. And the, probably the main cause, I th we're fairly confident that the main cause of those four extinctions was the wolf snake, a snake that arrived on the island in the 1980s as a stowaway, and it just slowly knocked these animals over until they're no longer there. Luckily, the blue tail skink and the Lester's gecko, we still have um, populations of that in um, captivity, but we now have those four species extinct from the wild. The white-chested white white-eye is a species that is extinct from Norfolk Island, and there the the cause is um, is rodents, and then the rightmost species, the bramble K melamies, is our first climate change cause extinction. This is a this is a tiny little rodent that we've lost that was living on the islands in Torres Strait, but the over the the majority of the animals that we've lost since 1960 90% of them of them were caused by invasive species so this is uh, quite a really pernicious threat a driver of loss now if we look at the species we have left in australia federally listed we've got about we've got over 2000 species that are threatened with extinction they're either endangered, critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. If you analyze the drivers of those of the loss for those species, again, we see that invasive species continue to be the main driver of the species that we have left, as opposed to the ones we've already lost. Now, this is a, a big problem. Um, now, many of the drivers uh, many of the species that were um, they're in trouble 
have multiple drivers, um, particularly for the plants. Um, so these threats work together often. Uh, it's not just one or the other. And this particular um, study that this was based on looked at the high impact and immediate impact drivers because there's often uh, even lower impact drivers. But again, it just re-emphasizes how important uh, invasive species are in terms of further threatening our, our wildlife, our plants and our animals. Let me just go to the next one. And then this is a study that we've drawn on that looked at those species that are not just threatened, but are likely to become extinct within roughly one of our generations uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, and again, invasive species are the big driver of loss. There's a bit over 100 species uh, that we are expect to lose within 20 years or so. It's a pretty short period of time when you really think about it. Um, and then because it's different studies, we've got different time frames. So the top the top list are the, uh, verte the vertebrates, uh, the animals, and the middle one are, uh, are plants, and the uh, bottom one are largely the, the plants we're likely to lose due to myrtle rust because already many of the plants are impact, but impacted by the arrival of myrtle rust about um, 14 years ago. They're now uh, unlikely to breed and we're likely to lose those um, plants once the adults die. Uh, the list on the top, I've highlighted some of the animals, uh, but I've highlighted some Galaxias, these are fish which have very localized um, habitat, very localized occurrence. And we've been quite worried because um, one of the particular galaxids, the Yalmi galaxids, it's a sub uh, catchment of the Snowy River. It was in a lot of trouble after the 2020 bushfires, and they only managed to collect a handful at that time. And they haven't been monitoring it for the last year. And we're worried that that might already be extinct. And these galaxies are under major threat from predation by trout. There's trout in almost all of its uh, former range. And it's only waterfalls that are keeping uh, the trout from moving into the last bits of its uh, habitat. So we've been raising the alarm of galaxies with the federal governments and the New South Wales and Victoria governments, because that's where most of them are hoping there's some emergency intervention to keep the trout away from those habitat of those galaxias. And there's a little bit of work, but you know, the, the, um, we, don't, we don't believe there's a credible plan in place yet for those galaxias. So there's plenty more, at least for uh, many species that are under threat from, from the invasive species that are already here in Australia. Now, I mentioned the invasive species can seem to be an overwhelmingly difficult problem to solve. The way we try to break it, break it down and think about um, the solutions is we, hopefully you can see my arrow here, we, we use this graph here over time, we map, if assuming an invasive species arrive like the rabbit, it maps over time, it's, it goes to spread to the uh, full extent of the habitat that is suitable for it. And in the, rab the rabbit's case, it it's, uh, can cover about two thirds of Australia and it stops at the tropics. And so by, if we break down the stages of invasion to those these different zones, hopefully as many of you would have seen this before, the prevention stage is by far where you get the biggest benefit for a small amount of effort. If you can keep something from arriving in the first place um, in, in our borders or in our region, and you get massive gains. And then you have a small window of opportunity for once it arrives, where it's only in a very small location where you can eradicate it. Once it gets too big, the eradication becomes unfeasible or too expensive. And I'm I'm, I'm here today in the Gold Coast in where the fire, red fire ants are in Southeast Queensland. And the government is currently mounting a massive eradication program, $150 million a year, roughly, they're spending. Um, 
the area covers about an area of size about three times the size of the ACT with uh, many millions of people living in it. It's a very complex operation and hopefully we can keep uh, the fire ants from spreading beyond this eradication zone and, and eradicating the completely. The containment zone is the next one where you know you, you have the opportunity of slowing it down and, and limiting it and you have a different set of tools. And in New South Wales, I think feral deer are a good example of that. They are still spreading. And if you have the right management response, you can prevent um, the, the the feral deers from covering the whole state, which they're projected to do. So that's the containment strategy. And long-term management basically means learning to live with it. This is uh, what we're doing with cane toads while they're sort of getting near the end of the uh, its growth. We just have to minimize the damage in localized places uh, and really biological control is usually the only answer um, for any sort of relief, if you're lucky. And we've just got to make sure we're applying best practice tools. We're investing in research to get more efficient. And, and feral cats is another good example. Um, they're covering every corner of Australia. And the best we can do is um, protect those species, either in, like Brian was talking about, in fenced havens, we can protect them on islands or um, intensive management. So this is, uh, I guess, the way we think about the problem, this biosecurity approach. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute because uh, the Invasive Species Council that I, I work for tries to ensure there's action on all those four fronts uh, by government and by the community so that we're actually making a difference. Uh, is those um, it, these different zones that I've just talked about. I won't um, repeat that. So basically the invasive species problem is a movement problem. Humans are um, deliberately moving things around the globe. Once we started um, moving, the ships started transporting goods and people uh, through the colonies. We're basically disrupting evolution and the isolated island that our species have evolved, evolved uh, the uniqueness over the millions of years we're breaking, basically breaking that that isolation and we're mixing all the species up. And so the really super um, predators, the super um, invaders get to destroy all the species, the naive species in the co continents that haven't grown up to get used to them. So Australia is suffering because of that. And this story of invasion in Australia was um, only something that is fairly recent in our awareness about the problem because this book here, Tim, Tim Lowe wrote a book, many of you will remember this in 1999 called Feral Future. And very few people who worked in and, and volunteered and um, um, was active in conservation groups didn't even realize this was a major driver of loss and Feral Future was the wake up call. And it was because of this book that our organization was formed because almost no one was working on this in a strategic sense. There's definitely people on the ground doing weeding and what have you, but no one was working to try to stop the next cane toad, the next fire ant coming into the country. Uh, and we, don't, we didn't realize the significance of their impact. And only recently has science really caught up and reminded us how serious the impacts are. So our organization is simply focused just on reducing that threat using that invasion curve uh, biosecurity thinking. And um, and we're, we're focused on um, advocacy, so to try to change government policy and laws and spending. We do a lot of detail analysis because uh, we need, often these scientific papers need interpreting and um we do a lot of work around how to improve the threat abatement system in Australia and New South Wales. We build partnerships, particularly with the agriculture sector, because the biosecurity system that defends us against invasive species is largely a system designed to protect agriculture. So if we can work with the agricultural community on building stronger biosecurity that helps them and us, we're going to get a better, um, a better outcome and as it turns out in governments, 
almost in just about all governments in Australia, the biosecurity system is run by the agricultural department. So I've got to spend my time convincing the agriculture minister to take on board the environmental concerns. And uh, luckily they often do, but often they don't. So that's part of the, uh, you know, the, the work we do, which is very different from many other environment groups. We actually have deep engagement with the agricultural sector. And then occasionally we do a bit of action. So this is us um, in Townsville where there was the yellow crazy ants out of control in around Townsville and no one was doing anything about it. And so we actually worked with the Townsville City Council to do baiting on the ground until we could um, manage to persuade the federal government to start investing in that um, eradication program. And now they've got, um, thanks to our efforts, about... Um, six or seven million dollars to actually take over that so now we've stepped back um, and let let the um paid people do it um i'm just taking you through a bit about the way we work and the, the things we focus on just to get to give you a bit of an idea of the breadth of our work because i think so many of you who uh, i guess see the pests and weeds out in the national parks and on your bush walks often don't realize there's these other drivers that ultimately will lead to these things landing in your national parks. And there's a lot of work to be done to try to head off some of the causes. So we do a lot of work on this system change, building a biosecurity system, um, stopping new pests and diseases coming into the country, making sure a lot of the economic uh, solutions are actually funding the, the, the solutions. So we often say that we need to fund the risk creators, all of that international transport network. Why aren't they paying for the cleanup operation to get rid of the fire ants? It's costing our governments billions of dollars. At the moment, they're not paying for their impacts. We get cheap global trade, but we don't. they don't have to pay for the cost. So that's um, something we're working on. In this prevention and eradication area, there's some major opportunities um, eradicating um, pests and weeds, particularly rodents and cats from islands. And uh, Lord Howe Island is a great example of success on that front. So there needs to be a lot more of that happening across the country. I mentioned ants a few times. Um, fungi threats are pretty important. You would have heard of avian influenza, which is a major threat that could impact on our wildlife and we were the ones who really sounded the alarm bell. And we've now got a bit of action from the federal government on that front before it arrives this spring. Um, you would have seen our work on feral horses in Kosciuszko, which, uh, again, it was one of those really difficult issues that um, uh, was difficult to counter the voices that want to protect the Brumbies. And we've, we've managed to persuade the New South Wales government to actually reintroduce aerial shooting in Kosciuszko. And for the first time ever over the last year, they've managed to remove more horses than are breeding up each year. And that's a major achievement that we've only just achieved. It's only occurred in the last few months. So that's a really big uh, outcome for us. Uh, uh, and then, um, Andrew, could I interrupt for just a moment? Look, yes, I've been Gary. following a couple of the discussions um, on, online that you may not have seen. But um, Tom Rogers, uh, I think, is worthwhile commenting on his comment, if you would put us, uh, give us some uh, something on this. Uh, Tom is questioning uh, the uh, assertion about how feral species is a greater, um, um, is not a greater uh, um, extinction cause than um, animal agriculture. I wonder if you'd like to say something about that. And, and can I remind people, uh, Ian didn't mention this, but it'd be nice for people to uh, put their comments in the form of questions that Ian might like to address later. Um, you can put doubt in there and ask for evidence. That's fine. But um, having explicit questions, which respects the um, uh, the experience of the uh, presenter, uh, is probably what we would prefer at this stage. So have you got any comments on that, Ian? Uh, just we just may oh, have to Andrew. go quickly because it's 7.39 at the moment and Andrew has to go at 8. So if we can... Uh, Andrew, how much roughly more do you have on your presentation, please? Yeah, I can speed up or even skip for the rest. I mean, maybe I can uh, answer a few questions if you like now, if you like. I think you graphically, you had a graph that actually showed the, the difference between the uh, agricultural impact and the uh, and the other. But anyway, yeah, over to yeah, you. We can go back to that. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, does ChatGPT produce uh, accurate yeah. uh, 
information. What, what If you look at worldwide, the impacts, invasive species are probably the second or the third biggest driver. But clearly in Australia... Um, I think you went past it then. Mm, but this anyway, is the yeah. one here. Yeah. In Australia, by far, invasive species are the biggest driver, uh, and particularly for animals. I mean, what's interesting is it's not to downplay the other threats, but for plants, often they hang on in very small areas without becoming extinct, whereas animals, often the drivers just wipe out the whole species. The whole species. So this is data that's coming. I guess the, the, the this is the thing. The literature is relatively recent. It's only in the last 10 years that the scientists have actually compiled all of this data. So there was a mistaken belief that land clearing was the biggest cause of extinctions, but um, it's it's very clear cut for the animals. Um, Forty nine of the eighty four animals and plants that are extinct are invasive species cause, and the mammals it's just it's it's just uh, so so clear it's not funny. So I encourage you. I can send papers around. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's an important paper by John Wanowski and et al. that um, really, for the first time, really highlights how big a driver this is. Um, okay. Well, do you want me to keep, with... answer a couple more questions? What? Yeah. And I think the other thing, Source, you can look at, the State and Environment Reports federally are starting to recognise this better as the science gets better. So... They, they are recognizing this as well. So it's not just me. Well, it isn't just me saying it. Um, there are, I would only say when we've got scientific papers to back up what, what I'm saying. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. If you can go back to where you were then and we'll see if we can get through it. Yeah, I don't know if that graph, graph really helps because that just talks about what are the causes of land clearing. So, um, mm. all right, I'll just, um, I might just, jump through I, I guess i was just talking a bit about what we do and i don't think that needs, needs to be the main oh, no, topic it was, to talk it, was about. All, it was all pretty good yeah, yeah I, so i talked a bit about what we're trying to do with biosecurity and prevent things from becoming worse um i probably want to remind you because in new south wales there's some really important um, commitments that the incoming labor government made when it was elected last year um, that's worth remembering. I think we should hold them to account. And we can't sneeze at 100 new pest and weed officers being established in the Park Service. There's um, an audit of invasive species that is going to come out in the next um, the next few weeks, which hopefully improves things. Um, I mentioned the horses. Um, I mentioned feral deer and a few other things. So New South Wales is making some inroads, but we can go a lot faster. Um, I wanted to just quickly touch on deer. This is um, a map showing where the deer are in the east coast of New South Wales, which is quite scary. Um, more than a quarter of the state has feral deer in it, and it's set to be 100% eventually after a few more decades. And this this map really just highlights um, you know, the hot spot around the Illawarra, um, where we've got rooster deer that escaped out of Royal National Park that we could have done something about a few decades ago, but it's also highlighting the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area as a major opportunity. And I've been working with the Park Service and local land services to develop a regional plan to try to keep these very low numbers of deer at that number and try to remove some of these isolated populations. So there's an opportunity for us to get behind. Um, and I just wanted to finish on just some perceptions of what people think think are the problems and where people are at and how to talk about this problem of invasive species because it's actually a difficult one. This is some um, some research we did, some, um, some quite large samples of the Australian population to see what people are thinking about what are the major um, environmental, environmental issues. And you can see invasive species, you know, scores relatively high and, you know, 80 89 percent thinks invasive species are a big driver. Obviously, they also really think there's other other causes, which um, is is um, totally um, sensible. Um, but thinking about the invasive species issue, what we see that the younger generation is less aware of the problem than some of the older generations. So that's interesting. So this forty three percent 
of the 18 to 34 think it's important, whereas older people think it's more important. So that's, I think, something to, to work on. And then thinking about affiliations, interestingly, the, the Greens are probably the least, Green voters are the least likely to think environment uh, invasive species are a major a major problem to the environment. And I think um, I think partly this is a perception problem about uh, understanding the, the nature of it, of the issue. Um, so that makes it more even more of a challenge for us. Um, thinking about how we're going to control um, invasive species, often you, you we've got to use a, a herbicide, we often got to shoot things, we often got to bait things. And often in the community, that's not popular. But if you can't use these tools, you basically the invasive species prevails. So this is a really difficult thing for us to work with. We have to understand these community attitudes. So I'm just going to finish on maybe some suggestions about how to talk about invasive species solutions. We, we say, don't use biosecurity language. Don't talk about the costs. Don't be funny about it. The things that are going to persuade you are the, the, what you're trying to say, whether it's an animal or a national park. I'll just go quickly. The sec second thing is make sure you've got facts to back you up. So if the horses are causing damage to the um, alpine, alpine she-oak skink in Kosciuszko or the corroboree frog, you need to actually have some credible evidence to back that up. And then um, and then the third one is to, if you've got a choice between um, doing something or doing nothing, I guess making sure that there's a choice which um, I guess you have to realize there is no simple way out. If you don't um, use some of these tools like lethal control, then the invasive species will be um, will take over. And the fourth one is you sell the outcome, not the method. And you don't talk about the method in detail. You talk about why you're doing it. So these are the um, these are the key tools to talk about invasive species problems. So I thought I'd just finish on that just to help um, help you um, maybe in your own work if you're trying to get more invasive species action on the ground, you'll come across some of these barriers. And these are some things you can do locally, and I might just finish on that. So I'll open up to questions, Ian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, very comprehensive. Um, there's, there's been some discussion on chat. There's a person there, Tom Rogers, who perhaps is uh, taking a, a view that uh, very much of the opinion that the uh, land clearing's the issue there, but he's got COVID and cannot speak. So um, um, I don't think we'll be able to hear too much from he, his point of view. Uh, but uh, it's there on chat and perhaps um, that can be looked at later. Um, Gary, do you do we want to take questions, Gary, or do you want to? Um, yes, just... I think I think that'd be a good idea. Give yeah. people a chance to put their hands up. You know, if um, perhaps they um, start up their video again, so we can see yeah, who wants if to ask. Everyone can uh, go yeah. on video. Yeah, um, I just uh, like to jump in at one point <laughs> as a sort of host. Um, and uh, I'm just, uh, I noticed that you, um, in those plants that you had uh, that were going to suffer, and one of them was Rhodamnia rubescens, um, which is uh, a wonderful plant in our national park. Um, and I've noticed uh, where I live, you can see the background behind me, that's um, near Bulga South National Park. And um, uh, walking down to there, there was a Rhodamnia rubescens, which disappeared um, in the last five years, and there was further north there's a few situations where it was and and then uh, actually around uh, around red cedar flat there's a fairly large um, collection of them but um, i'll just uh, go to share for a moment i don't know if uh, if, if that's possible but um, i'll just just yeah if everyone can just see this picture here of the radamnia it's got three distinct um uh, veins as it were central vein and two on the outside so it's it's it, that that's really going to hit us here uh, so so um so thanks for pointing that out uh, Andrew and I'm very sorry that nothing much can be done for the deer rhodamnia and also very as well that there's a lot of shooting in the national park of deer at, um, they're really cleaning them up um in the terrain um there's in the north end where the tree tree canopy is low and they can do aerial shooting from helicopters and they do it early of a morning and use um, 
in sensors that can sense the animal and um, infrared and they can get them and clean them up quite quite well but down where I live which is the south end was a more extensive tree canopy and it's a problem but we've got the rooster deer and they're they don't just stop at the national park they're all down through Stanwell Park they're all down the Illawarra they're, they're going everywhere so it, that's a problem that people can see quite easily around here but thanks for right for doing it um, yeah, I've got the hand up here. So yeah, go, um, Gary. Uh, yeah, one interesting thing that you might like to comment on, um, Andrew. Uh, they recently did a um, a audit, a, a like a a uh, scorecard for the species that are within Royal National Park. And they did it for plants, animals, and quite a range and ferals. And they basically found that there were hardly any feral cats in Royal National Park. And which came as a surprise to many of us in our local branch. Is there anything that, you know, groups like the Invasive Species Council might be able to get from this as to why some areas might be suffering from feral cats, which are pretty much nasty over most of the country, but we've got this funny situation where there's plenty of foxes seen on multiple cameras, automatic cameras, night cameras, and yet they didn't pick up cats. Would you like to make any comment on that? Gary, can you also show your video? Yep. Uh, yeah, you've got it stopped again. I tried oh, to I'll, video. I'll it off. There we go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there we yeah, go. Yeah, Gary, um, the, the density of, of cats in the landscape depends on food sources and um, um, habitat types, and it sort of it varies over time. Mm. But, the, yeah, there is... I um I know on the east coast of Australia the foxes tend to have more impacts than the cats. Mm. Um, I think the cats might even sorry the yeah the, the foxes may even get to higher densities than the cats in some areas. Um, and we know there's a lot of fox baiting that, that happens around Sydney, and when that happens, the bandicoots come back. So it's pretty kind of straight correlation. I mean, I can't really speak to um to uh, Royal um. I guess some of that would have been cyclic, cyclical, depending on the fires and what animal and food sources there are since the fires and whether there's enough to sustain cat populations. But usually it's something like about one cat per square kilometre, between one and four, depending on the habitat type and, and, the, and the conditions. So I'm sure there's a lot in there, but um, I guess you can only, if, if, if that's what they're, they're saying in there, there's um, then I guess the surveys are saying that, and then, then maybe there's a another underlying cause for that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Mm. And I'm just wondering because there was a few questions about extinctions. I, I, I wanted to. I might just bring up one slide that I haven't yeah. shown that well, might be well, a, nice. illustrative to those people listening. I'll just share this thing here. This is actually a page from the the Gone report. Um, what I wanted to show just to really, I guess, the evidence of, of what is going on. This is every species that scientists have recorded that have become extinct since the 1960s. And we've grouped them by different um, major drivers. Mm, mm. And, you know, you, you can, these stats are what, oh, you yeah, know, the stats don't lie. So you can sort of get a bit of a feel of the things that are, what's going on. We lost a lot of our frogs because of, chytrid fungus mm. habitat destruction we lose actually the victorian grassless eelers dragon was just rediscovered a few months ago so i'm gonna to have to take this one off the list um and uh the nielsen park she oak was lost um that's lost from our national sydney harbour national park so there's i guess a habitat destruction loss but you know it's pretty clear cut what's going on here in terms of recent extinctions um even right up until i meant i've showed those Christmas Island ones um, and the white chested um, white eye from Norfolk Island. Uh, th there's a pretty, pretty straightforward story here. And I think this is what I think our organization is trying to do to, uh, I think, educate many people, re-educate many people that um, what we think is the problem is maybe different to what, uh, what is really going on. And uh, that's, when I was working at National Parks Association, I didn't understand how big a driver the um, invasive species 
uh, threat was uh, until you start to see some of these stats, and it's just pretty it's pretty uh, difficult to uh, get your head around. So um, that that's just um, this. People can look at this table themselves in the report. I'll I'll put the copy of the link in the mm. chat. Mm. I'll stop sharing. No, that's fine. That's fine. No more questions. questions. No more questions. Perhaps what you might do is, well, we've got about five minutes left. Um, we could perhaps. So, well, I think Tom Rogers is a bit challenged to speak, um, but uh, he's pretty uh, fired up about habitat clearing is what kills animals and land clearing and habitat. I don't, I don't know if you can see the chat, Andrew. And yeah, I can. And I'm not. I'm not saying that. Yeah, you know, I I totally agree that land clearing causes many the loss of many species, mm. and we don't want to downplay that whatsoever. We need mm. habitat. Mm -hmm. We need habitat without invasive species. Otherwise, yeah. what habitat we have left won't won't actually be a home. Um, mm -hmm. So we need to be we need to be addressing all the major threats: climate, habitat loss, uh, invasive species, change fire regimes, change water flows in our rivers. Uh, if we're doing we're tackling those big threats, we're going to start to be making a difference. And it's not a competition. It's we need to be addressing all of the problems. I must say I'm so pleased and heartened to see um, NPA has done a lot of work regarding the the snowy mountains and the and the uh, the feral horses there uh, a terrible problem whole uh, topographies have changed whole landscapes have changed the flow regime of of, of, of just they were formerly where there were lots of uh, swamps and and um, vegetation and thick green vegetation just changed to flat um, denuded landscapes with almost stormwater canals of, of the water just rushing through and changing it it's uh it's a it's a wonderful thing that uh, i know debbie thompson from um, npa has done a lot of work down there and had to fight hard against the the other people and uh it's, and, and we thank you for your your side of it. We don't think so much about, know so much what you've done. So it's good that we've, and it, hopefully that legislation can be introduced sooner rather than later because uh, yeah. everyone should realise that Kosciuszko National Park and the, and the Alpine regime, we, the Alpine um, area there is unique in the world. It's absolutely unique. It's not a common Alpine. It's a, it's a low Alpine uh, with lots of um, lots of vegetation and lots of species. Yeah, we're trying to get a petition signed by at least ten thousand people, Liz's hand signatures, to repeal the uh, Kosciuszko Wild Horse Heritage Act, mm. just protecting the horses. So that's uh, being done over the next uh, six months before we um, present it to Parliament. So look out for that. The Reclaim Cosy campaign, which. Originally, National Parks Association was part of the uh, five founding organisations. With us, we're now um, taking the lead on that. So that's definitely um, a major challenge. And I guess it's, I guess the horses are modifying the habitat. So I guess it's mm. sort of like an invasive species is um, reducing, removing the habitat for the species there. So you, it's it's effectively two two threats on top of one. Yeah, yeah. Now let us know um, through through to Gary if you like, um, and we can get everyone in the. Southern Sydney and NPA to sign up for it because I'm sure they would if, if they sure, would. Yeah, I, I might uh, let the organisers know that just so that they um yeah, they've got a supporting audi audience here. That'd be great. Thanks, Ian. Oh no, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, absolutely essential. Um, anyone, anyone else? Well, I don't know if I'm seeing if there's any hands up. Well, it's seven fifty-eight, uh, Andrew, and I do understand. I think you said you wanted to leave at eight. <laughs> yeah, I've got to drive some people back back into Brisbane. So, uh, but um, oh, if there's if there's one last question, I'm happy to take well, it. Or I might else... do. I'll get Gary to give a vote of thanks. I think if there's no other questions, so Gary, can you um, give a vote of thanks to Andrew for that wonderful yes, presentation? Look, I'm I'm happy to. Look, um, yeah, me like Andrew, you know, wasn't moved too much by invasive species until several years ago when the Invasive Species Council started um, really advocating in exemplary ways. I mean, I listen to a lot of media about a lot of issues, and I've done so for 50 years, whether it be radio, TV, um, NGO, magazines or what. But 
I know that those damn fire ants need a massive amount of action to stop them getting up to stage two of your graph, Andrew. Um, you, you, and I, I always know, having seen you work as a CEO and all the issues you covered in NPA, that you always put science number one and evidence based uh, actions. Um, you wouldn't get by in today's world unless you were like that, um, and unless you get blitzed by the powers of darkness, of course, which uh, many of us do on a regular basis. But um, clearly, um, the Invasive Species Council is a major NGO that um, raised the um, profile on species like the fire ants and uh, helped uh, help to run and manage a major campaign on the feral horses. So um, you, you're up there with the best, Ian, as far as Andrew. educators, environmental educators and advocates go. And um, the talk tonight, if uh, quite brief, uh, was full of evidence um, and full of enthusiasm and, and inspiration. So I thank you for your time and multitasking to fit us in. Uh, really appreciate it and remind everyone that um, it'll be uh, on available by um, YouTube in the not too distant future. So thank you very much. Maybe people might like to show their Yep, there's or something like that, or and flat or nice whatever you want to do. Uh, there we go. Thanks Matt, again. Give us a job. Uh, all too brief, but thank you again, Andrew. Yeah, and thank you, Gary, for the vote of thanks. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, good. good on you for everything that South Sydney Branch does for MPA. So you just keep banging away and um, getting the, the 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 wind. So congratulations you for keeping the effort going. Okay. Great thank work. you very much. All right. We're all okay. Thanks again. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good, good night, night, everyone. Same oh, place, man. same time this uh, Monday of the month. Yep. So see you next time, folks. Okay. Bye for All now. All the best. Ta-da.